This program is made possible by the Mosaic Company, giving farmers the tools to grow more abundant crops, committed to environmental responsibility. Mosaic, we help the world grow the food it needs. I'm Elam Stalsfus, an independent filmmaker. On January 17, 2012, four explorers, a conservation photographer, a bear biologist, a conservationist, and myself, began a 1,000-mile trek from the southern tip of the Everglades to the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. The purpose of this expedition was to bring attention to the importance of wildlife habitats, corridor opportunities, and the life-giving waterways that run through the heart of Florida. Journey with us as we discover untold stories about people, places and wildlife, and how they are all connected. The Florida Wildlife Corridor expedition started with a bear, and then it became a map. This is a story about connections that highlights the conservation legacies of Florida. Thousand Miles, 100 Days really sort of resonated as something easy that um, people could grasp onto, could understand. The idea of landscape connectivity is starting to come more into the mainstream and we're starting to discuss it now nationally. The Florida Wildlife Corridor Expedition follows in the tradition of explorers before us. William Bartram, John Muir, more recently Michael Fay. If I had one wish, it would be that thousands of people around the world take walks like this because it's the only way for for individuals to understand the complexity of what we're dealing with and why it's important. You guys are crazy. When, when I saw Carlton give a presentation at the Everglades Coalition meeting, I looked at the trail you guys were gonna take, this team was gonna take, and I have been in these environments in South Florida, and I've been to them by helicopter. I can't imagine, I've walked through these sawgrass swamps, I've walked through mangrove, I've walked through mud, mall, but not for days on end. We fly over this place a lot. I guess I, would, I give uh, the group here that's willing to uh, get into the Everglades, get boots on the ground, get muddy, and uh, it's also dealing with the unknown. The more people that have these kind of objectives and the more that they bring it to the public and to leaders, the more that humanity will come to understand that we really do need to get our act together and protect this planet because if we don't, we're all sunk. Florida Wildlife Corridor, which uh, you have mapped out, I believe in uh, time, and this will become a reality, and people will come to understand uh, the way the wildlife uh, moved across uh, the water systems and uh, the different uh, topographies in a way that uh, made the connection just a very natural connection in our world. Yeah, I'd say that's fine. Last night entailed another 4 a.m. morning of wiring some solar panels and configuring some electronics so that we can stay connected and do the reporting we intend to do from the field. Well, I'm pretty anxious. I've been working pretty hard to get outfitted and uh, coordinate the folks that are planning on meeting us and get permission and those kinds of things that have, have taken a lot of time away from mental preparation. I can't remember a week where I've slept this few hours in my life, but I guess I can't say I've ever been on a 100-day journey without having a chance to come back either. So braving new territory for myself personally and really uh, looking forward to getting out there. Last night when I was driving into the park, I, mean, I was just thinking about, 
you know, all of the conservation giants who had the foresight to protect a lot of these places in Central Florida and Everglades National Park especially, and how lucky we are to be able to experience that. It's not only wild places that we're seeking out and we're going to get to explore, but it's also going to be a wild adventure. It's a great day. I mean, here we dreamed about this for a year and a half, and today is today. Is today. You know, we've put things together and put things together, but now when we pack and we hit the water at noon today, there's no coming back. So I know all your boats are very carefully balanced with all the weight and everything, but there is one thing I'd like you to take along on your trip, okay? I have a coin here from, from the superintendent's coin of Everglades National Park. I want you guys to carry this with you, and when you wrap up with your, after 100 days and 1,000 miles, Pull this out and remember how we started right here. Okay. We will. So, okay, here's the way you're supposed to do this with the Okay. It's really exciting, I think, to be the start off point, the launch point for uh, a thousand mile, 100 day adventure and expedition that's going to take off from here and work its way all up to Okefenokee. And that first night was really special because we had a late start and it was perfect conditions and beautiful light. But then we snaked our way in through this beautiful channel to the chicky of the first night. After we left our Oyster Bay chicky yesterday, we paddled directly over to the Wilderness Waterway, which is a 99 mile canoe and kayak trail through Everglades National Park that goes from Flamingo to Chocolosky. When we left the mangrove islands and moved past the last mangroves into the sawgrass, I really felt like an explorer for the first time. Because we didn't know we were gonna sleep that night. We didn't know how far we were gonna go. We didn't know how much water there was gonna be and when we were gonna have to carry our boats. And it was, it, it was a big adventure. That was just absolutely amazing coming across the sawgrass prairies right through the heart of the Everglades. Being able to do this was always on my bucket list, to explore the river of grass. We paddled and we push-pulled for three days and never saw another person. While in this area, there was this sense of solitude and sanctuary, right in the middle of a wilderness and vast space. Yesterday was one of the most unique and amazing days of my life. We um, pulled nearly 12 miles through the sawgrass of, of the heart of the Everglades. We had about two hours in the dark following the line, kind of flying by instruments on the GPS. And I, mean, I ran over two alligators that nearly threw me out of my kayak and um, couldn't quite tell what was coming around each corner. And we came into this canyon of cattails where you couldn't see what was coming around the next corner. I felt like we were just kind of waiting for an ambush. It was just a, a big transition from kind of the Everglades as God intended to this other, this other world. We've come to our spot in our journey where on the map it all looked great. First dry ground we touched in days, but we were low on water. And so the next day when we woke up, that was the first concern. And the next issue was we needed to find the canal. We thought this was gonna be an easy paddle when we got to the base of the C-67 canal. And I could tell this wasn't going to be easy. First, we had to unload our kayaks, get all of that stuff moved north to the point at which we could put into the canal. Then we had to carry our kayaks that whole way. In muck and overgrown vegetation, that was not an easy task. So we wore ourselves out doing that. The Everglades definitely made us work for every inch. You know, they say inches matter in the Everglades. And the Everglades made us work for every inch. When we finally arrived out of a week in the Everglades to meet up with the Marshall Foundation with their 2012 Everglades Canoe Expedition. 
the same kind of like a historic crossing because they were doing this big week-long expedition all the way up from West Palm Beach and the eastern headwaters to the Everglades. And by our paths crossing, we connected Florida Bay all the way up to the Loxahatchee. And so that, that was an exciting time. After kayaking for eight days in the Everglades National Park, we began our trek west, first with a brief study in the tree islands, then to the Big Cypress National Preserve, the Fakahatchee, the Picayune Strand, and the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. To summarize what we've been doing on tree islands for the last uh, 15 years is to try and understand why the tree islands are disappearing and to come up with a way to restore them. We have discovered that these are little oases for wildlife in a very large landscape and that they play a critical role in the ecosystem. What we're dealing with is a system that's been altered over a hundred years ago. And the, the ecosystem has grown up around an altered hydrology, and it has fostered a different community that existed 200 years ago. So it is a big deal. I really admire what you've done with your photography over the past number of years. The amount of awareness and appreciation that has been brought for Florida's wetlands, Florida's swamps, the big cypress forest. I mean, you, a lot of that appreciation can be directly attributed to you being a lens into that world. And that it sets a real role model for photographers like me to try to make a difference with yeah. our work. When I discovered Florida, and then I, I realized most photographers were shooting birds and gators. That's mm -hmm. what shooting in Florida was all about. Which is fun, it's nice, to do. It's, it's a fun occupation, but I felt that people need to know what the landscape was here. Mm -hmm. That it is unique in the world, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you very much for <laughs> taking us into your world here and sharing it with us. Conservation photography simply is photography that empowers conservation. It seems obvious on the surface, but it's kind of a, a discipline that's just finding its footing. For years, kind of the conservation purpose seems to have been lost in the broader field of nature photography. Many people were going out to capture images and to create art from nature, but not as often connected to using those images for a purpose of achieving conservation. Kind of interesting because it can be argued that the first form of documentary photography was conservation photography. I know Clyde Butcher always talks about everything in the Everglades is layers and layers. It's like an onion. Yeah. And once you leave your car and get out in it, you realize how many layers there are. It's just your eyes widen the more you learn about something. You know, it just becomes more, uh, I don't know, more spectacular. The more you know about something, the more interesting it becomes. Okay. Feeling that connectedness with the landscape is what we need to promote more of, where you feel a part of the system. We already know we literally are. We right. eat, we breathe, we drink clean water, everything, all these ecosystem services that are provided for us for free. But yet when you get connected to a certain fraction of the landscape, that's when really good things happen. The more we can encourage support for protection of land by allowing people to utilize that land and get out and explore it, the more opportunities that we have to protect other areas of land that need to be protected. You really need people to have a connection to these places, to get out and explore them and experience them firsthand. And the more you can do that, the more support you're gonna build for further protection in other areas of the country. Big Cypress is such a wild area. It's still wild today. But we're out here for the total experience and, and to, the, to experience the wilderness and the peace that's out here and the quiet. You're out here, you become more attuned to what's going on around you. And you can kind of just feel all that stress, you know, go away. And uh, that's why I like so much to try to bring as many people out here as I can to share it with them because it's, it's experience. If you haven't been here, it's hard to understand this place. Uh, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world. The Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge is really, it's like a super highway for panthers. So 
it serves as a corridor from Picayune Strand uh, State Forest and Fakahatchee Strand uh, State Preserve to our south and Big Cypress to our east. This is really an exchange zone for those panthers. For large carnivores like Florida panthers that can have these enormous home ranges of hundreds of square miles, they need obviously a lot of space in order to, to create those kinds of home ranges. And often those home ranges are gonna be bisected by roads and, and other uh, man-induced changes on the landscape. And so it's incredibly important uh, to create wildlife corridors branching out from even here uh, through the private ranch lands to our north that will help us in our overall uh, biodiversity, uh, help ex the exchange of large mammals and predators like panthers and bears. Habitat, habitat, habitat. I think it just all comes down to places to live. Um, panthers are shown to be very adaptable. You know, they can use a wide variety of, of habitats down here, but they just need big spaces in which to live. Wildlife and species need that fluctuation, need to be able to move from landscape to landscape. And the only way to do that is to preserve the corridor. The corridor here through the central part of the state is largely intact. And I really wish you all well in your uh, mission to, uh, to, to highlight that to the American public. So the wildlife crossings, as they were first envisioned, really weren't dedicated to Florida panthers, but to all of other uh, Florida's wildlife, like bear, alligators, you know, mink, otter, and wading birds. There was a lot of concerns that, you know, here you're going to be plowing this interstate highway through these very fragile areas, and that's what we just walked through. Those are some the very first wildlife crossings put in put together in Florida and they have been tremendously successful uh, uh, since the wildlife crossings and fencing have been in place mortalities have dropped down to nearly nothing we put about 13 miles on today we left uh, one of the primitive camping sites out at Big Cypress Swamp early this morning and came across what they call the additional lands and just saw some untouched areas, places that I don't think too many people go anymore. It was like a poetic day for us. We came waist deep out of a cypress swamp, photographing bromeliads at waist level, and then 300 yards later, we're horseback. My family has been in Florida for 170 years, and extremely blessed to have a grandfather that was a game warden that introduced me to the Everglades when I was three or four years old. And it was very interesting how you fall in love with something. Uh, the smell, the beauty, uh, the sunrises. So I've lived uh, the life of the Gladesman from that time forward and, uh, and just love uh, the beautiful Everglades of Florida, one of the natural wonders of the world. This morning we had a fantastic journey through your property and at one point we saw a bear and a panther track right beside one another. And I imagine there are not too many places in the state where you can come across that. It's very beautiful because God created it and, and we want to keep it that way and we're looking forward to working, you know, with the federal government and the state to make this uh, corridor for the best interest of the people of Florida. It was really special to arrive at the Caloosahatchee River the way we did. We had been hiking and biking and trekking through a pretty patchy landscape from the OK Slough on up to the banks of the Caloosahatchee. There's a couple of properties here that have about five miles of shoreline along the south bank of the river. It's absolutely critical to protect if those panthers are going to continue to move across the river in that direction. It's also one of the most pivotal properties from a conservation perspective because this is currently going through foreclosure and could be lost to a trailer park or a subdivision, or it could be purchased by conservation groups like the Nature Conservancy to protect it forever into the future. But it was really nice to kind of transition and get out the paddle boards for the first time. We had a kind of a long, you know, 30 mile scale journey ahead of us, but we had the elements in our favor and a nice, east wind at our backs and we were able to get on the paddle boards and 
travel more than 20 miles in one day. And it was, it was really, really relaxing to see everything go by. Welcome to Archbold Biological Station. Uh, we are Oops, absolutely delighted to be able to host the Florida Wildlife Corridor as they pass through our region and pass through Highlands County. The floor is yours for a couple of minutes, Carlton. Oh boy, hey, don't go away. Don't leave me all alone here. <laughs> well, thank you, Hillary. Thank you all for coming. We're on day 36 of our 100-day, 1,000-mile journey, and it feels like... Um, Yes, yesterday we were here for the bear workshop in 2009 where folks like Tom Hawker were presenting and it was a workshop that Joe Guthrie and Wade already organized and we hatched up this idea of a public awareness corridor program and an expedition. It's very good to be here. I've been with Carlton and Elam and our, our fourth member of our expedition, Mallory, for the last month plus coming through South Florida, but it's been it's so gratifying to be here where I've spent so much time um, kind of studying the landscape. A huge number of the jays in the landscape have disappeared. Yes, we have good stepping stones like Lake Placid scrub, but we also had places like Placid Lake Estates, which had 120 families of jays in 1991 and now has nine um, because of urban development that's occurred here. Can you tell us approximately how many plants would be unique to this Lake Wales Ridge geology? Um, there's about two dozen plants that are either only found in the Lake Wales Ridge or found just barely off of the Lake Wales Ridge. Some of the chemicals that are in scrub plants were discovered by uh, the late Tom Eisner and were new chemicals to science. They never had been found and never been manufactured before then. And it's just, it's just another reason that uh, these organisms are worth protecting because they may have direct uses to, to humans that we don't know about yet. The indigo snake is the largest non-venomous snake in North America. They reach up to eight and a half feet long. Their range is from South Georgia down to the Keys. They eat anything they can swallow. They're non-constrictors. They have to subdue their prey and eat it whole. Um, they're known and documented to eat every venomous snake in Florida. Today we're doing radio telemetry. We put transmitters in these indigos and I track them three times a week and we take the, the GPS of their location. The indigo mortality is road kills. That's what we see most often. So we're trying to quantify it, which will help us better manage lands down here and for the indigo snake. So we're in a classic rosemary bowl. These are typical on the high, dry areas of the Lake Wales Ridge. And you'll notice there's lots of open space around me. So this is, um, this is the uh, saw palmetto or Serenoa repens. And in the scrub, we know it grows very, very slowly. Several research biologists at Archbold, particularly Warren Abrahamson from Bucknell University, have come back every year for 40 years and seen how much longer is this stem this year than last year. And by patiently doing that, they worked out on average that this Serenoa is growing about 1.2 centimeters a year. That's not very much. And then by doing a simple thing, what is the shortest possible growth distance between the furthest point on, these two, on this same individual? Uh, many of them appear to have been five, six, seven. There was even one 8,000 year old palmetto in the samples. I always had reverence for them because I knew they were hundreds of years old. Now I have reverence for them as thousands of years old. These are our sequoias and our redwoods and our bristlecone pines of uh, Florida. It's just that they grow along the ground rather than up into the sky. You were working at, at Buck Island Ranch and you were, at, you were at Archbold having lunch and Hillary said, Joe, there's someone you need to meet. Hillary's like, yeah, you gotta meet this guy studying bears here on these ranches. And I'm like, what? Bears and ranches? I'm an eighth generation Floridian and I didn't even know we had bears on ranches. Florida black bear, it's been very much a, a big piece of what we've been working on. And so we're very mindful of the need to connect the different parts from, from the big cypress up to Chazawiska over to Ocala, all the way up to Osceola, and then all the way over to Apalachicola and to Eglin and the Panhandle. We wanna connect all those populations. The Florida black bear is most interesting to me in terms of 
how it travels. One particular animal we put a radio collar on was M34. M34 we caught in October 2009 in a part of the, the county where we'd not really documented very many bears. And then in 2010, he took off, started in Sebring, and tracked northeast across Avon Park Air Force bombing range, continued up into Osceola County, close to Yeehaw Junction, Lake Marion, then to Lake Kissimmee, around the south end of Lake Kissimmee, where he swam across the river, back over toward the Lake Wales Ridge, up through Lake Wales, frostproof. He got all the way to I-4. He couldn't get across I-4, hanging out there at Celebration. And then he kind of turned south and back down the ridge, back across Avon Park Air Force bombing range. He found the Kissimmee River there and followed it all the way to Lake Okeechobee. Once he got to Lake Okeechobee, he headed west into Charlotte County and the Babcock Ranch, and finally turned back to the east and came back into uh, Glades and Highlands County within about 25 or 30 miles of where he was originally caught. In total, it was about 500 miles between May 8th and July 8th in 2010. Some of the conservation lands that our bears are visiting are private lands. They're on conservation easement, and the people are managing them for a variety of wildlife, deer, turkey, quail. There's a natural uh, state left there, and bears are visiting, and uh, we had a female that denned in uh, some private land just uh, east of here on a private property that's in conservation easement. For us, it's real important because the more room they have to move and transition from one area to the other and one population to another, the less they're gonna get in trouble. You know, we live in a state with 18 million people and we still have bears and panthers. That's just amazing. And that, um, you know, there's still wild places and wild things left in Florida, just uh, that no other place has. And so that's one of the cool things about this expedition, it highlights those connections and quarters. And Florida black bear is a poster child for maintaining those connections and maintaining habitat that they can move through. It was such a neat experience to be invited by the Seminole tribe of Florida to the Big Cypress and Brighton communities. The council members, the tribal elders, they took time to meet with us. They encouraged us. Oh, and one thing that was really neat was the ladies cooked a traditional meal for us. It was so interesting to see and learn about their history here in Florida. You know, the expedition that y'all have undertaken to raise awareness means basically the survival of Florida later on, because uh, we, we've got to have the, the wildlife habitat. We've got to have large pieces of it moving around. Through all the three wars, we have uh, eight clans left here in Florida. Five of them are uh, creek base, and the uh, other three are Miccosukee base. You see, before wartime, creeks, that was the largest population. By end of wartime, Miccosukee is the largest population, and creeks are very few. The clan system's been well for us, and uh, it's protected us. Mm -hmm. My son said somebody walking across the state of Florida or something. And <laughs> so he wanted, yeah, so. Us, he wanted us to cook traditional meal, including swamp cabbage, stew beef over rice. He wanted the turtles roasted, so we have two turtles roasting. And then we're going to make pumpkin bread and then a regular fry bread that's not sweet. I said it, we're happy to have you here and you came out to see how we live and how we do things, and that's good, and have a good time while you're here. But we have Seminole history, and our students have that class two days a week.
I have a long family history in Florida and a lot of that heritage is tied to cattle ranching. So this was a, a personal opportunity for me to help you know, reconnect with my own heritage and also try to be a window into that ranching story, which is so important for the future of our wildlife and our water, not just protecting that culture. I also serve on the board of Likes Brothers Incorporated, which is a large family agribusiness in Florida. It's a fifth generation company and it's been operating at the ranch for a number of years. And it was great for me not only to get to see my family's lands in a different way, but also just to make sure that the messages that this expedition is delivering are beneficial to similar landowners. So many of the interactions with the ranchers meant so much to me. The, the way that the ranching community throughout the state opened up their properties and their stories to us really meant they are trusting us to help tell a story that they've kept pretty close to themselves and pretty quiet for a long time. I love to get up in the morning. I'm happy to get up because I love what I do. And a lot of people can't say that. Landowners who own these type of tracks are typically good stewards of the land, that they have a lot of uh, sense of value to the, the, the uh, ecosystem and the animals that are here and the natural lands. And it's important for the animals, and it's important for the farmers and ranchers, it's important for water issues, but it's important for our way of life. If we didn't have these lands to come out and enjoy and, and see God's beautiful country, it would be a, in a sad state. Florida's unique in that it's a biodiversity hotspot. It's unique in, in the amount of, uh, the large amount of private ownership compared to a lot of other states out west where there's more public ownership. And the key question is how do you provide incentives? How do you provide real economic advantages to those owners uh, for keeping those lands in, in their natural or agricultural state? A conservation easement is an agreement between a private landowner and some entity to protect conservation values of some type on their property. And what that means is a land trust or government can enter an agreement with the landowner to say, keep your land like it is today. If we got this ranch conserved with a conservation easement, I mean, we will be here forever in perpetuity doing what, you know, we want to do, which is cattle ranching. I like it because we're providing clean water for people to drink through our water recharge, clean air for them to breathe, wildlife habitat and aesthetics, which they don't have on the East Coast or the West Coast. It's all here in our agriculture corridor. As has often been said, it's always been, the seemed like it was the cowboys, or the tree huggers, and um, then when we finally got the barrier broke down, we found out we have the same common interest, and we just have to create a common language to, to come up with a way to get to the same place. And, uh, and I've seen a huge change in that on the positive side for, for both sides. It's going to be very important for not just our agencies, but the other agencies out there, as well as the non-governmental organizations and land trusts to, to work together and partner with private landowners to, to conserve these valuable habitats that are inland. Anytime somebody has, a, has a, a personal connection to an activity or a piece of property or has an interest in, in something, they're more likely to take care of it. When we came from Cuba and in 1959, and we're very fortunate that, you know, we had a country like the United States to go to, that, you know, there were real opportunities. And, you know, my parents have always drilled in me in that, you know, the one thing that, that we lost in Cuba was our heritage. You know, through programs like this can preserve that heritage. It's almost like preserving you know, the Grand Canyon or any other national treasure that we have because once it goes, you can't get it back. What people don't understand is many of the people in the cattle business today, it's, it's not just about the return, but it is about the lifestyle. It's a way of life. My dad always believed in the bottom of his heart and the message that he tried to get across to us kids was the fact that none of this is ours, that it belongs to 
the Lord Almighty and it's on loan to us. And there is a challenge that goes along with the loan and that's to make sure that we're good stewards of the property and that we do nothing to hurt it and only do things to try to enhance it or improve it. So for us to continue to work on conservation efforts and to connect up these landscapes and these waterways uh, is something which is uh, a keystone both for the conservation legacy and leadership of the United States and also for the economic future of the United States. I want the people of Florida and the people of our country to know that there is this amazing culture of people in the Florida ranching community who have been on that landscape and sometimes for nearly two centuries. And it is because of these ranches that we still have the opportunity to protect a corridor for water and for wildlife. It's really great, and you guys are going around, you're gonna connect a lot of people in a lot of places, and, and you know, you're kind of like the, the wandering bears yourself, uh, trying to go through these, these natural lands, and, and you're confronting places where some of the stretches you take aren't very pretty, and, and you have to walk along highways or whatever. Um, we want to have Florida be both human habitat and, and natural habitat. We're standing here on the banks of a almost restored Kissimmee River. Um, the Avon Park Air Force Range is right here. The Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park is right here. We're about halfway between Lake Okeechobee and Lake Kissimmee. Crossing the Kissimmee River was a lot of fun. That body of water symbolizes so much for the restoration of the Everglades and is such an essential part of the corridor. It was a major milestone for us crossing the river that day, and um, we made the most of it. Uh, you know, we're, we were all kind of in a playful mood. It was a really nice, beautiful, warm day. It was warm enough to, to dip your toes in and, and be comfortable, so, you know, we kind of splashed around as we were, as we were crossing, and I don't think um, my mother would be too pleased with us playing um, in the river where they restored it so that the large alligators are on the way back. There are some really unique species that exist in the prairie and kind of nowhere else in Florida. Um, one of our specialty species is the Florida grasshopper sparrow. This Florida grasshopper sparrow subspecies is found only in the dry prairie landscape. They are found nowhere else. The Florida grasshopper sparrow is highly endangered. Based on our surveys last year, there are probably two, three hundred birds in existence. That's exceedingly endangered for a bird species. This is likely the most endangered bird in Florida, possibly in North America, but definitely the rarest bird in Florida. That morning on the creek ranch by the horse barn was one of those moments where this expedition and the power of what we were doing really became real to me. And it really blew me away. The route of our journey that day was, was so symbolic. The day we rode from Creek Ranch to Disney Wilderness Preserve was one of the highlights of the expedition for all of us. We were joined by some folks uh, from the ranching community who were generous enough to lend us horses and uh, saddles and, and kind of guide us up to Disney Wilderness Preserve is the highest point we would go in the Everglades watershed. And it was just amazing, the, the generosity of these people and the care they clearly have for Florida, especially Central Florida. Unbelievable. So we rode through the private ranch, across conservation property from the South Florida Water Management District, and finished out the ride on the Nature Conservancy's 12,000-acre Disney Wilderness Preserve. And so it tied it all together, and it was kind of a, a symbol of what we're trying to do with this whole corridor. Different ownerships, different backgrounds, but all working together towards the common goal of keeping it connected. What is remarkable about Central Florida is that it is a landscape of ranches and just incredible natural beauty. People don't think of that when they think of Florida. 
there's a real opportunity to, to educate the people and to have people see a different side of Florida. So I think it's incredibly exciting what you're doing, taking on this, uh, this challenge. And what an incredible thing to do, to have said you've done in your lifetime. You, you know, you've uh, walked the length of the state. It's, it's amazing. So I uh, admire you all tremendously. And I think that you are an incredible inspiration. We're at the Florida Turnpike Crossing here in Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area in Central Florida. About to cross underneath. This is our first day on the Florida Scenic Trail and we've been really impressed with the trail so far in terms of just a um, great route and we look forward to following it in the whole second half of the journey. Where are we, Carlton? Where are we? We just entered Bull Creek Wildlife Management Area, and we're now in the headwaters to the St. John's River. Day 55 of the expedition. Pretty awesome. After hiking on the Florida Trail for several long days, we finally crossed Florida's Continental Divide. One thing that I was looking forward to was getting back into the kayak. We finally got a much needed break by paddling with the current on the St. John's River. About halfway into our journey on the St. John's River, we uh, stopped by a boat ramp to pick up some special guests. We'd started off in a remote swamp and came by and there was our Attorney General Pam Bondi and our Commissioner of Agriculture and former Congressman Adam Putnam who came out to paddle with us for the day. And that was just an amazing experience. So these are two of four people on our state's cabinet, some of the most powerful politicians in our state. Before that morning, they were two Floridians loving the outdoors and joining us to be part of the journey. People in Florida, they go to Wyoming, they go to Utah, they go to Colorado. We have amazing wildlife right here in our state. You know, this expedition has highlighted the relationship that private landowners, farmers and ranchers have with the land, their stewardship ethic, and how we can create a quilt that creates a corridor that runs the length of the state that is public and private lands, conservation easements and non-conservation easements, and all of them together create a habitat that uh, guarantees that the Florida that we love will still be here generations from now. I think we can all do more to protect our state. And as a cabinet member, of course, I'm part of Florida Forever, which is so very important to protect our state. You really have to see it in person to appreciate what a vital resource it is for our state. The Little Big Econ State Forest and the Charles H. Bronson State Forest are the last parcels of public land that were purchased a few years back that now connect the upper St. John's, the very origin of the St. John's River, way, way down in Indian River County. Got protected land on both sides of the signature natural feature of this part of Florida. You're as close to the middle of nowhere as you could possibly get in the state of Florida out here. That fits into the wildlife corridor because that's really what we want for wildlife. We want things to be in the middle of nowhere. You guys are the first people to actually walk, hike, paddle the Volusia Conservation Corridor from the south end of the county to the north end of the county. First people to be able to do it. You couldn't do it until this year. We were the first county in the whole country uh, where the people taxed themselves to buy conservation land. That was in 1986, and from the very get-go, we decided the best way to do that was to try to create corridors uh, in partnership uh, with other agencies to be able to, to create these large swaths of habitat. And so we started that in the late 80s. Uh, we had some good help and good partners. And, and so uh, today we can say we've actually completed it, or at least completed the connections. Popularity of buying conservation lands has been tested many times over the last several decades, not just in Florida, but throughout 
uh, it's kind of uh, uh, gratifying that the public really does seem to get it. It's important to have some conservation lands as sort of the fabric that we work on in this state. This part of the county has been the Volusia Conservation Corridor Project that was established under Florida Forever. So there's been partnerships with the Water Management District, Volusia County, and uh, the state forest system. I think anytime you uh, work on behalf of the public and you're spending uh, tax dollars, you have to be held accountable to that. And so uh, we get a lot of inquiries. I think the key uh, issue for us is educating uh, the public. They know what they're getting for their tax dollars. And we believe the return on this investment is very high. I think people are very supportive of what we're doing in these programs. We're all rooted to this land. We either came here or stay here or live here because we appreciate its natural beauty. And so that's part of the value system of being a Floridian. We weren't quite prepared for how busy I-4 would be when we approached it. Spring break was in high gear and the interstate was just packed with cars all moving 75 miles per hour. So to be an animal moving at human speed was pretty frightening. You know, you got across the first lane of traffic and then you were in the middle in the median and you're facing another solid wall of traffic speeding cars. Left no doubt that this is a, an area that needs an underpass between two important conservation properties where there are likely to be a high amount of roadkill. There's been considerable planning in here. Uh, District 5 of DOT has actually been very progressive in wildlife crossings and different measures to Im increase permeability of the highway. So that is something that's ongoing and even on some of the roads that were nearby here, uh, there's plans for wildlife crossings. Wildlife crossings are just one way of uh, mitigating for the impacts of a, of a highway. As traffic increases, it makes the road harder to cross. Um, and for some animals, the roads are a complete barrier, even at low traffic levels. It's a way to, to kind of increase the size of the habitat without having to buy more land, is to just connect two halves. Well, we've been at this now 80 days, and you know we've been on the move, and sometimes it takes all the energy that I have just to get from point A to point B. On the St. John's River, just south of Lake Harney, uh, there was a morning, it was really foggy. I was really tired that morning. I didn't really feel like getting up, but I noticed the fog was rolling in, so I kind of waited, I waited. Here again, the kayak was only 15 feet from the tent. And I wait till right when the sun was getting ready to break through. I grabbed the camera, got on the kayak, went around the bend of the river, and right there was a scene. There were some marsh grasses uh, and just paddling right into the sun. We're on the Ocala National Forest, located in central Florida. We're pretty much surrounded by Orlando, Jacksonville, Tampa, Gainesville. So we get about three million visitors per year because we're centrally located and a lot of people can come out and enjoy the forest. We have a lot of trails. We have the Florida Scenic Trail, which I believe you all have been hiking some of that. We have some beautiful springs that people love to enjoy. It is a national forest, so there, there could be people in Connecticut or Oregon that value the, the Ocala forest just because they know it's here and they like to know that there's public land that will always be here. It'll be here 100 years from now, 200 years from now for people to enjoy, but also for, for the animals that use it. So I, I think a lot of people like the idea of a public land being managed long term for many mm -hmm. benefits. The Florida Trail was another great phase of our expedition. Once we were on it, we didn't have to worry quite as much about getting lost or making the wrong turn. There was a trail there, but it happened to take us through some of the most remarkable landscapes in Florida. 
One of the taglines for our Florida State Park system is this is the real Florida. We have 160 state parks spread throughout the state of Florida covering about 700,000 acres. And I'm a firm believer that in order for folks to appreciate the environment, they need to get out in it. Bird watching is one of the largest recreational activities, one of the most popular recreational activities in Florida. And what a lot of people don't know is that people come from all around the world to Florida in order to see birds. We have such a diversity of different birds here and uh, birds in different seasons. And it's important that we maintain the habitat. I think Florida has set the standard, at least for other states in that regards, from conservation, for wildlife uh, preservation, for hunting preservation, for just the different aspects of outdoors in general, and getting Floridians into the outdoors to enjoy what we have in the great outdoors that's existent for most all Floridians. When people look at the Grand Canyon Niagara Falls, they think, oh, those are the spectaculars of nature. But actually, I think our, our springs, our rivers, uh, these hardwood forests that we're sitting in the middle of right now, those are just as spectacular to me as anything that you would find in any other part of the country. I want people to have the feeling about Florida and our conservation lands is that's where they want to go vacation. Do what we're doing. Get out and walk in these woods. And I think you come to have a great appreciation uh, for the gift uh, that we've been given. Rainier controls about, well, approximately 400,000 acres in North Florida. One of the most powerful statements, I think, of the philosophy of the people that own the for forests and the people that own the farms and what you guys are trying to do to connect those. If you've ever read uh, Cross Creek by Marjorie Rollins, in the last chapter of that book, she talks about who owns the land. <laughs> One of the things she says is that if we think we're the owners of the land, we're deluding ourselves. We're not the owners, we're stewards. We're sitting here in 2012, and we've got just this amazing opportunity that a lot of people don't have to have sustainable communities and be able to enjoy what we're sitting here in the midst of today. What stands out for me on the Suwannee is just a real sense of discovery. I hadn't experienced a river quite like that ever before in my life, and so I was kind of breathless with anticipation at every curve because you could stand still and ponder every tree almost. The whole experience was just otherworldly and wild. The tannic waters of the Suwannee River were just pushing through this uh, steep valley in steep banks where you had ribbons of white sand separating the river from the deep woods and these Ogeechee Tupelo trees in full spring bloom in a green so bright it's hard to describe, like draping out over the river. And we spent five days, you know, camping on, on sandbars and on beaches and paddling this amazing river right up into the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. It was quite appropriate as we stopped at the Griffiths Fish Camp and enjoyed throwing frisbee and diving into the Swanee River and under perfectly sunny skies and hot weather, waiting for renowned explorer Mike Fay to arrive. And right about when he got there, the sky opened up and the lightning bolts started flying and we, we kind of elevated the adventure a little bit for the, for the last day and a half. And just as we came into the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge, you know, Lightning struck about three times in about that many minutes, right behind the sign that says, entering the Okie Pinocchio. <laughs> it was kind of an, an appropriate kind of tone for, for the end of things. Because <laughs> we got pretty cold yesterday. It poured pretty much all day. It's not the rain. It's just like after six hours of rain, you start getting chilled. So if you look at this red line as a corridor, and then you think about I-95, you know, and you think about from a human perspective, if we all of a sudden tomorrow cut I-95 in a thousand places, just chop it up. And you think, well, what does that do to disrupt human kind of flow and, and economics and, and transportation and goods and services with every other species on Earth? That's pretty much what humanity has done. It's just incredible the opportunity we have, and uh, you know it's on 
it's on our watch to, to see if we can find this balance. And um, you know, we're sitting here on Earth Day, and it's, it's a Sunday, and you know, thinking about, and this is the land that God gave to us to, to take care of, and we still have a chance to help keep it patched together. And so this balance that has to go on between how we as uh, humans impact uh, the earth that we depend on to live and that we protect it for future generations is something that is embedded in this concept of connecting up wildlife corridors and waterways and landscapes because the more that we can connect them up, the better off we are going to be as a country in advancing a conservation agenda. And it's not just the United States of America because the whole world watches. Brazil is watching what we do in conservation, as is Africa, as is Europe. And so everywhere around the world, what we are able to do as we connect up our landscapes is a, a great example to all of humanity and to the entire Earth. This idea of a connected wildlife corridor across Florida is ongoing. With past and future work from many partners, this vision of a wildlife passage linked together across the entire state of Florida can become a reality. Thank you for going with us across the wilds of Florida. Into the wind, our wildlife will prevail. Against the current, far from the beaten trail. Against all odds, it's the wind that fills our sails. Into the wind, against the current, far from the beaten trail. Into the wind against the current, far from the beaten trail. This program is made possible by The Mosaic Company, giving farmers the tools to grow more abundant crops, committed to environmental responsibility. Mosaic, we help the world grow the food it needs.